Do you want to run a gothic horror game that makes the hair on the back of your player's neck stand up and keeps them on the edge of their seat? Well, keep watching and learn the 10 techniques plus one bonus technique to running a truly horrific game. This video is brought to you by Dark House Rules Games and their new adventure slash campaign expansion, Ravenloft, Prey of the Black Wolf, available on the DMs Guild soon. Tonight I'm going to cover 10 techniques plus one bonus technique that can help you engage your players in any horror role-playing game. These techniques will work in any game system or genre. They could be applied as well in Star Wars or Dark Sun as they could in Call of Cthulhu or Ravenloft. It's all about setting the right mood and getting your players invested in their player characters. As I go down the list, I'm going to start with the concepts that will help you as the DM understand what makes a good horror role-playing game work. Then I'll move on to the techniques that will help you set the proper tone for your players. Some of these techniques you may think are a little odd, but you don't have to use them all. You can pick the ones you think will work best for your group and try them out. Now let's get started. Number one, understanding the difference between a gothic horror game and a more traditional role-playing game. The difference between a gothic horror game and a regular RPG is primarily in tone. It takes some skill to make your players actually feel fear. In a regular game, the use of dramatic tension is less important than in a gothic horror game. The tension of not knowing what might happen next will help keep your players hanging on your every word. Player characters in a regular game are the heroes of their stories. In a horror game, they're more like the victims. Players need to question if anything they think about themselves or the world is actually true. Will their sword pass harmlessly through the werewolf? Will their spell fizzle when it hits the ghost? Will the mummy knock the holy symbol out of their hand and throttle them when they try to turn it? Your players need to think that more likely than not that their player character's actions may be futile in the face of unknown evil. This brings me to the other major difference between gothic horror RPGs and standard RPGs. In gothic horror games, the unknown enemy is the source of the horror. The antagonist of a gothic horror game should be some nameless fear that the players can build up in their minds. Their own imagination will do all the work of creating something terrifying if you just give it the space to work with. I will go into how to do this in more detail further on down the list. Number two, setting. The setting of a proper horror game should have at least these two characteristics. The first characteristic is it has places that are isolated or remote. This could be anything from a dark wood in a remote wilderness area to a room that the door is locked or held shut. In either instance, the player characters should have a strong sense that they are on their own. If something bad happens, there's not going to be any rescue for the PCs. The second characteristic is that the setting is dark or shadowy. This will increase your player's uneasiness. Who knows what could be lurking in that shadow in the corner? Places that have been abandoned or are far from other people make good settings for horror games. They can invoke in the players a sense that they do not belong and should not be there. Technique number three, seduction and disillusionment. One of the other big differences between gothic horror in particular and regular RPGs is the player's belief in their own virtue should be under attack along with their physical well-being. This can be a source of horror because a good number of the monsters in a gothic horror game were once human or of a playable race. If they are presented in such a way that emphasizes this, your players may be able to identify with them even if only on a superficial level. And if they do, they may realize that it is a slippery slope from hero to monster. Now if the PCs can be manipulated through seduction or misdirection, to performing a morally questionable act. This can make them question just how pure and good they really are. It can be horrifying when they realize the blood staining their blade belonged to a righteous man. 
This can be as great a shock as any grotesque reveal. Technique number four, unexplained death or disappearance. This one will set the mood more quickly than almost any other technique on the list. If the players see that NPCs or even PCs are being taken without explanation, it really ramps up the tension. The first Alien movie was a great example of how this technique can be used to good effect. In that movie, people are being killed or turning up missing. Until late in the movie, the crew of the ship has little idea of what they are dealing with or what it is capable of. All they know is there is no safe place and if they don't do something soon, they'll all be dead. To go back to setting for a moment, the Nostromo is a perfect example of a remote setting full of dark shadows. To put this technique into practice, you can show your players an NPC, make that character seem strong and or competent, then have that NPC be killed or taken in an instant, just out of the PC's sight or ability to assist. For example, the NPC could be the captain of the town guard. He could be talking with the party about an investigation. When the conversation is done, he could close and lock the guard tower door between himself and the party. As the party turns to walk away, they hear the captain cry out in alarm. They hear the crash of breaking glass and a desk being overturned. It only takes the party fighter a few seconds to kick the door in. When the party enters the captain's office at the base of the guard tower, it is empty. The place has been ransacked and is covered in spattered blood, but the captain is nowhere to be found. A scene like this not only shows that no place is safe, but also that no one is safe either. That brings us to technique number five, give your players something to lose. Help your players become attached to their PCs. Have them come up with their own backstories instead of using one out of a rules book. Talk with them about their character concept to help them see their character as a person and not just a collection of stats. Maybe let them have a cherished mundane item. The more your players love their characters, the more they will fear losing them. One other way to make your players' characters more precious to them is by making them harder to replace. If when a PC dies in your game, their player has to start over with a first level character, then the thought of PC death will give your players a sense of dread, as it should. On to technique number six, play using theater of the mind. Miniatures and terrain can be super cool, but they are not well suited for a horror style of game. There are two reasons for this. Reason number one, they're a distraction. No mini, no matter how intricate or grotesque, can compare to what your players' subconscious fears can present in their mind's eyes. Reason number two, fear of the unknown is the primary driver of a horror game. That fear cannot be tapped if your players can count out the five foot squares to the villain and come up with tactics that give them the greatest mechanical advantage in battle. Using this technique presents many of you with the problem of how to play theater of the mind. Nowadays it's a mostly lost art, practiced mainly by grognards such as myself. For once in this video I will say, fear not, it is not that hard. It involves using descriptive language to set the scene and you as the DM keeping track of where everyone is and what they are doing. Use a dramatic voice while you are describing everything and everyone. This will help set the tone of the encounter. Remember, people have five senses. Don't limit your descriptions to just sight and hearing. Here's a short example of theater of the mind play to give you an idea of how it works. The DM to his players. As you exit the silver mine, you are surprised by how brightly this full moon has lit the area around it. You approach the mine cart that you stowed your gear in, and behind you you hear a blood-curdling howl. Above on a ledge, silhouetted by the moon, you see a huge wolf. It leaps down in front of the mouth of the mine and growls threateningly at you all. Your prisoner Elgin begins to laugh hysterically to the point that he falls to his knees. 
What do you want to do? I want to cast Magic Missile at it. Get between it and Nomiko and bash it with my flail. Draw my short sword. If Elgin tries anything funny, I'll run him through. Run over there and hack it with my bastard sword. I want to keep my spear pointed at Elgin's back, but have my dagger handy just in case the wolf gets close. Very well. Everyone roll initiative. Dang it, I rolled a nine. I didn't do much better. I got an eight. Three! Yeah, baby, I got a one. I got a five. Not bad, I guess. And Elgin rolls that. Okay. And the wolf gets that. All right. Okay, Rogan, go ahead. You have plenty of uh, movement to make it to where you need to and still have time to make your attack. All right, I run over there and swing at it with my bastard sword using all my might. And I roll 17. You hit. Roll damage, please. Nine. You swing so hard that all your efforts go into damage and not accuracy, but you're still able to hit. Your blade skips off the top of its skull but still bites into its flesh, nearly scalping the wolf in the process. I think that gives you some idea of how theater of the mind works. I'm not going to go through all the characters, non-player characters, and monsters in this encounter because that would take longer than I want to spend on it in this video. I do plan on making a video solely dedicated to how to play Theater of the Mind soon, though, so keep an eye out for that. Now that we have Theater of the Mind behind us, we can move on to technique number seven using music or sound effects to set a creepy mood. You can set up a playlist of spooky music and let it play at low volume in the background. You can do the same thing with noises like crickets, thunder, or rain. There are lots of sources for music and ambient noise. Right here on YouTube is one of the best. Now for technique number eight. Have everyone don costumes or use props to help them get into character. This may seem a little silly if you've never tried it before, but it can be a lot of fun. You don't even have to have complete costumes. Something as simple as a brooch or even a blanket pulled over a player's shoulders to simulate a robe can really increase immersion. Number nine, remove distractions and discourage metagaming. Because gothic horror relies heavily on immersion, it is best to play rules light. This should help cut down on metagaming. I would also advise your players to only bring themselves one set of dice for when you can't roleplay out a situation and their character sheets. Cell phones and even rules books will ruin suspension of disbelief. Now we come to technique number 10, play in low light. Play in a room that is filled with shadows, save for a small circle of dim light that is just bright enough to read by. My cousin used to run a second edition Ravenloft game that we would play either by candlelight or in darkness with glow-in-the-dark dice. It was an awesome experience. Playing in a dark room gives your player's imagination a lot of room to work with. Finally, that brings us to the bonus technique. Use things your players find disgusting or revolting. Fears of contamination or infection are deep-seated in the human psyche and can be put to good use in-game. Well, those are my 10 plus 1 techniques for running a gothic horror game. This is by no means a complete list. If you have a technique that you use in your game to set the mood that I didn't cover here, please help your fellow DMs out by leaving it in the comments below. If you liked this video, please like it and share it with a friend. That would really help me out. If you'd like to subscribe, you can hit the icon in the middle of the screen that looks like a dark elf. For more information about Ravenloft Prey of the Black Wolf, you can click on the card in the upper left corner and it will take you to a playlist that will tell you all about that adventure. And if you'd like to check out one of my non-horror related videos, click on the card in the lower left hand corner.
Thank you very much, and I hope you have a great day.